Okay, today we are going to look at fungal classification. So for this you're going to need your fungal phyla chart uh, that you can find on Sakai. You might want to print that out because uh, we're going to go through the various phyla. So originally um, fungi were put in the plant kingdom and it was mostly because things were either animal, vegetable, or mineral, right? So they were considered a vegetable because they didn't move. Um, they came up out of the ground like plants did. Uh, but then as uh, more and more information became available and closer looks were taken at it, uh, they looked and noticed they have no chlorophyll. Um, and so looking at the phylogenetics of it, realized that the fungus needed their own kingdom. So they got promoted and became their own kingdom. So a little bit of information about fungi, um, particularly looking at the cellular level, their cell walls are made up of chitin, not cellulose, but they do have cell walls. Um, and just as a little bit of information, uh, chitin is what, what makes up insect's exoskeleton or your hair and nails. And because fungi are so closely related to animals, it's often difficult to treat fungal infections in animals because things that you would use to break certain cycles also affect the animals as well and you can't have that so it tends to be a little bit difficult. Um, fungi do store their food as glycogen not starch so they are more similar to animals in that way than plants. Okay so this is where everything falls in uh, that we've been comparing. So we are still in domain Eukarya and um, we have basically branched off of a single common an ancestor from the animals and the coanoflagellates. Um, those along together with fungi have a common ancestor and then they are broken down into these various phyla that um, we're going to go through. So here they are. Um, these are the Basidiomycota, Ascomycota, uh, Glomeromycota, uh, Chytridiomycota, Zygomycota, and Microsporidia. Um, just a little bit of information um, that might help. Mycota is used to designate a phylum, while the word mycete um, denotes a particular organism. So for instance, our Basidiomycota, the uh, fungi within that are called basidiomycetes and they actually also produce spores called basidiospores. So in that sense fungi is pretty easy in their terminology. Okay so basidiomycota and ascomycota form what's called a subkingdom and that subkingdom is called dicaria. Do you remember what a dicaryote is? Um, we have seen it before so just kind of go back through those memories and see if you can come up with where you've seen that before. Okay, so this is why um, those two fall into the subcategory dicaryota. So remember with our fungi we have these hyphae. Now hyphae are not technically male and female but they are um, what we call a plus and minus strand. That's what we designate them as. So just two different genetic strands. Um, so our sexual reproduction in fungi, um, which by the way is the less dominant way of reproduction, typically you have asexual reproduction, but, but let's talk about this sexual reproduction of the ascomycetes and the basidiomycota because those two form the subkingdom dicaryotes. Okay, so to start with we have a plus and minus strand and in this particular diagram each one of these boxes represents um, one cell, one hyphal cell. Okay, so we have two cells of the plus strand and two cells of the minus strand in this instance. So what happens is the two fuse together and at first there is just fusing of the cytoplasm and the genetic material is kept separate. So within that uh, enlarged hyphal strand with the cytoplasm mixing all together, 
we have a 1n plus 1n cell and another, um, that would be another hyphae that's another 1n plus 1n. That stage is called the dikaryotic stage because it has genetic material from each strain, the plus and minus strain, but they have not fused together yet. Okay, so that stage right there is why they are included in the subkingdom dikaryota. Okay, so then the next stage then of course is the nuclear fusion and that's where we get our diploid zygote. Okay, as the diploid zygote um, grows, then it undergoes meiosis within the sporangia to produce spores. And the spores um, are haploid, again, which I guess I didn't write in here, um, because they've undergone meiosis. And then once those spores begin to grow, then new mycelium or new hyphal growth occurs. And then that start cycle starts all over again. So let's start with the basidiomycetes. Remember, in that they're in that subkingdom, dicaria. These are the club fungi, so they are going to be most familiar to you as the mushroom caps, um, like the mushrooms that you eat um, would fall under basidiomycota. And they reproduce sexually um, via the formation of specialized club-shaped end cells called basidia. Um, and they are the second largest phylum of fungi So this is just to give you a look at the anatomy of the basidiomycetes. Um, remember we talked about having a fruiting body and a mycelium. Um, so this is where that starts to play. This is the fruiting body of the basidiomycete and it's called a basidiocarp. And it's most recognizable by these gills. And this is probably the most familiar type of fungi to you. Um, at the end of each of these gills, we have right here, it's called a basidia, and that's where basidia spores are produced. And then as they are dispersed, then new basidiomycetes form. So here are just a few examples um, of our, uh, our club fungi. Um, like I said, our normal mushrooms that you're used to seeing are, are the most common representative of that. The other thing we see a lot of is this shell fungi. And when we go on our field trip for our lab, we'll be seeing a lot of those. Um, bird nest fungi, if you've ever seen that. Um, puffballs, stinkhorns, all of these are representatives of the basidiomycetes. Okay, but like I said, um, our mushroom, gilled mushrooms are really the most common to us, right? What we're most familiar with. So here are the different uh, parts of the anatomy of our mushroom. You'll notice at the bottom we have mycelial threads. So that's the very base. And then the top portion is the basidiocarp or the fruiting body of the basidiomycete. And so it has a stem also called a stape. Technically a stem would have vascular tissue and it would be a plant, so that's really not something we would call it. We would either call it a stape or a stalk. Um, it always has this annulus and has a vulva as well. And you can tell this is where the stape grows. And then of course it has the gills, or also called lamella. And then it has scales on top of the cap. Okay, those are all the features of our gilled mushroom. Okay, so here is the life cycle of our mushrooms. And note that as it's in the subkingdom dicaryota, the dominant portion of the life cycle is dicaryotic. Okay, so here again is our gills and the basidia at the end that then produces through nuclear fusion. Remember we have our cytoplasmic fusion our, our, and then our nuclear fusion that takes it into the diploid phase right here. And then that portion undergoes meiosis. 
putting us back into the haploid phase. And that's where on these basidia, the basidiospore are produced. And then they're released into the air. And based on what you saw earlier with um, everything from the gilled mushrooms to the puff paws and to the, um, the egg nests, those are all different ways for dispersing these spores. Okay, so the gills, most this particular type, the mush, the sorry, the the gilled mushroom, those spores are going to be carried away by air, and then the egg nest ones, they actually require water to drip into them, and then those spores are dispersed as the water splashes. The stinkhorn one uh, relies on flies to disperse their spores, so they're all kinds of adaptations in the basidiomycota as to how to disperse these spores. But once they germinate, then hyphae begin to form in the plus and minus strain that we talked about. And then this is where that cytoplasmic fusion happens and puts us back into the dikaryotic phase. And from there, our capped mushroom begins to grow. So this is a basidiomycete that is native to North Carolina, specifically here in Durham, and it's called the green spored lepiota. And it's unique in that it produces um, what people like to call the fairy ring. So if you look at this image on the right, you can see this circle, and that's very characteristic of the green spored lepiota. So what happens is in this center of the circle, that is where all the mycelium underground are and then they send up their basidiocarps in order to <clears throat> disperse their spores in a ring such as this. So now when you see these in Durham, you'll say, hey, I know what those are. Another thing to know about them is that they are poisonous if you eat them, so do not eat them. Um, but these are native to our area, so I wanted you to have a look at that. So fungi can be great and help with decom decomposition, but they can also be damaging, particularly to crops that we use for food. So rusts and smuts are particular types of fungi that attack crops. And so we want to stop those. And the life cycle of them usually requires an alternate host. So just like we used to see in some of those um, uh, parasitic worms, you know how they had multiple hosts? Well, that's true of these fungi as well. So here's just an example. This is the life cycle of a uh, wheat leaf rust. So if it gets into crops, um, particularly fields of wheat, it can knock out the entire field and not only have an economic impact, but also impact um, the food supply. And they can be very difficult to get rid of. So wheat rust has two hosts, obviously the primary being wheat. Um, the secondary is what we call a meadow rue, and that's that picture up here on the top left. That's what that looks like. And so obviously they grow in similar places to the wheat. So one of the ways that we can try to knock out this wheat rust is by getting rid of the alternate host. So to get rid of this meadow rue. So some farmers will uh, buy, for instance, Roundup resistant wheat that's been genetically modified so that it can't be killed by Roundup. And if you round up the field, then it will get rid of this meadow rue, therefore, eliminating the possibility of the wheat leaf rust. Okay, so we talked about basidiomycetes and ascomycetes both being in the subkingdom dicaryota. So what's some of the differences between them? The most important difference is that the spores of the basidiomycetes are produced externally on the ends of those specialized cells called basidia. Do you remember that? Well, in the ascomycetes, the spores are produced internally in a sac called an ascus. 
So ASCO mycota then is what's called the sac fundi fungi, and they can re reproduce sexually or asexually. And this is where we have our single-celled fungi, um, yeast. Most fungi is multicellular, but yeast is a prime example of a single-celled um, fungi, and it is within the phyla Ascomycota. So Ascomycota, um, some of the unique features that they, is that they are able to digest materials that are normally difficult to break down, um, such as cellulose, lignin, collagen, fuel, paint. Um, they are also important symbionts. They produce antibiotics. And the, some of the things that affect us is that they, um, this is also where the fungi that produce yeast infections or athlete's foot occur as well. So these are great in that they can break down things like fuel and paint and that's wonderful, but then they are also um, the ones that are not so great for us because yeast infections and athlete's foot, mm, that's not really fun. Okay, so we said that the ascomycetes could produce asexually or sexually. So let's start with our asexual reproduction. Um, that can be accomplished in two ways. One is by budding, and usually yeast are the ones that reproduce this way, and it's just exactly what it sounds like. Um, the individual cells swell, they produce more cytoplasm, and then they bud off into a new cell. The second way is by producing spores called conidiospores, and they're produ produced at the tips of the hyphae, and so this image on the right, we're gonna be seeing um, some of those, and molds tend to produce Canidia spores, and remember that is asexual reproduction. So what about the sexual reproduction? Um, I told you the terminology is pretty easy on a lot of these, so the fruiting body of an ascomycete is called an ascocarp. Just like in the basidiomycetes, it was called a basidiocarp. So sticking with our ascomycetes, it is an ascocarp. Now, the ascus is the sac that develops during sexual reproduction. And within the ascus are the dikaryotic hyphae that we had talked about. And that's what undergoes meiosis to produce ascospores. Okay, so here is our ascus and it produces ascospores via meiosis. So these ascus here are dikaryotic. Hopefully that is making sense to you. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this, um, looking at one of our ascocarps. Remember the ascocarp is the fruiting body of an ascomycete. And so we're gonna look um, up close at just one of these folds. And so here is the ascus. So here we go. And those are the ascospores that are produced. Those ascospores, remember, are produced sexually. So this is just one thing that's so neat to me. Um, during the BP oil spill of 2010, if you remember that, it was um, over here in the Gulf Coast, and the ascomycetes were used to aid in clean up, clean up of this oil spill because they can digest fuel. So a super important uh, fungal group as far as that goes. So ascomycetes are also important because they play a key role in symbiotic relationships with other organisms. Three examples of that is with termites and then lichens and mycorrhizae. Termites actually keep fungal gardens within their colonies because, um, the, remember, these particular fungi can break down lignin. And if you remember that is, or maybe you don't remember, sorry, um, that is a key component in the cell wall of wood. So here are lichens. This is our second group of symbiotic relationships 
with ascomycetes. And essentially what we have for a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between the ascomycete fungi and either an algal cell or a cyanobacteria. Most of the time it's an algal cell. And so what happens is the fungal component of it is able to break down uh, wood or dead material or even rock where the algal component or cyanobacteria is able to produce sugars that feed the fungi so they have that symbiotic relationship the fungus breaks down organic material or rock material um, into components that are a usable form for the plants and the, or not plants, for the algae and then the algae is allowed to then use those um, in a way that they couldn't before and because they're photosynthetic they produce extra sugars that then feed the fungi and there are three different forms of lichens that we're going to see in lab um, and also see on our field trip uh, the first is crustose the second is fruticose, and the third is folios. And crustose, I don't feel like this is a fantastic picture. I'll definitely show you better ones in lab. They really do just form like a crust over the material that they're encompassing. Fruticose um, has, just like you can see here, they kind of have these fruiting bodies that stick up. They're much more feathery looking. And then folios, is, that's the easiest one for me to remember because the texture of the lichen reminds me of foliage leaves, if that makes sense. So those are the three different forms. The third symbiotic relationship with the ascomycetes is what we call mycorrhizae. And this one's extremely important. It's a fungal symbiotic relationship with plant roots. and in a natural setting, over 90% of vascular plants have mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and so the benefits of that is that the mycorrhizae increase the surface area for nutrient and water absorption. Remember we talked about how huge that was with the fungi hyphae, that they have a huge surface area to volume ratio? Well, this is where that starts to come into play for the plants. And the mycorrhizae also break down larger molecules, allowing for the minerals um, to be absorbed by the plant and that's especially important in like phosphorus absorption. So this is how that works. The fungi germinate in the soil and then infect the roots of the plant and then the mycelium spread throughout the root system and throughout the environment. So again um, the symbiotic relationship is that the larger molecules are broken down by the fungi for the plants and again plants being photosynthetic have extra sugars that they can then supply to the fungi. So ascomycota form what's called an ectomycorrhizal relationship with plant roots and what that means is that the fungus only invades the external um, most portion of the roots and they form sort of this uh, net around the root, but they don't penetrate into the what's called the steel of the root, which is the innermost part. So, so they form this ectomycorrhizal, so ecto being kind of outside the outermost portion of the cell, I mean, sorry, outermost portion of the root. So that's the type of mycorrhizal relationship that ascomycota forms. So why are these mycorrhizae relationships important? Um, because they allow for plant roots to have access to minerals that they otherwise didn't have access to, more organic material, as well as more water, so greater absorption power. And that has an impact on economic yield and crop yield. So this picture up on the top is just a demonstration of how much we know that is important because you can now add mycorrhizae to your soil to make sure that your plants are going to do better. So home gardeners know about this, farmers certainly know about it.
truffles anyone? Uh, they are also in the Ascomycete family. Um, it's actually a mycorrhizae with either beech trees or certain oak trees as well. So just wanted to bring that to your attention because a lot of people really like truffles or truffle oil in their foods. So this is the category that it falls under. Now having said all that, not all Ascomycota are good fungi. So here is a classic example of an Ascomycota that is detrimental. It's uh, Claviceps purpurea, the ergot fungus. And so what you see here is a head of rye. And as you can see, once they get infected with this ergot, they get this dark purple coloring to them. And so that's why the purpurea portion of the scientific name is because of the deep purple that occurs there. So there is a theory that the ergot fungus is what was responsible for the Salem witch trials of the 1600s, the late 1600s. And so when you take ergot infected rye and you ground it up, um, ergot produces these very toxic alkaloids that have similar effects to LSD. Um, outbursts, uh, just crazy behavior, and that is kind of the definition of bewitched behavior. So in Salem, Massachusetts in the 1690s, um, there was a lot of witch-type behavior in a very Puritan setting. So interesting to note that in 1691 um, there were lots of downpour, um, just all kinds of precipitation, that conditions that would lead to heavy fungal infections and the primary um, grain being used by the people in Salem of that day was rye. So um, <laughs> the setting is certainly ripe for this theory that this is what was responsible for um, the witch type behavior and that led to the Salem witch trials. Because then by, um, I believe it was 1693, I could be wrong on that date, but there was a severe drought that would have wiped out all of the rye uh, crops and would definitely have killed all of the um, ergot fungi. And that happens to be when there was a decrease in the Salem witch trials. Now, why all women in the Salem witch trials? I don't know. <laughs> so that's a slight thing to be thinking about as well. I did add a video to your Sakai site that just kind of walks you through this. And it's just really fascinating. So I definitely suggest that you take a look at it. Okay, our next phyla is the glomeromycota, um, also called the AM fungi or arbuscular, uh, sorry, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So these form symbiotic relationships with plant roots as well, but instead of being ecto um, mycorrhizal, these are endomycorrhizal. And so if you look here in this image to the right, you can see the micro, the the fungus living within the plant cells and um, they are obligate symbionts which means they cannot live apart from their plant counterparts and there are only 230 species known. So these branched hyphae of um, our glomeromycota living within the plant cells are what's called arbuscules. That's why these are called the AM or arbuscule mycorrhizae. So here's the endomycorrhizae and um, they don't form that dense uh, net or mantle around the, ex around the exterior of the root. They penetrate the root cell walls and grow um, into a tube that's formed by invaginations of the root cells membrane and they go further into the root into that steel portion. So here is a look if you think about having taken a cross section
of a plant root, and this is just looking at one portion of that cross section, just so you can see the difference between the ectomycorrhizae and the endomycorrhizae. I wanted you to be able to take a look at that. Okay, traveling right along, we are now moving into the zygomycota. Um, they are saprotrophs as well as are um, many of the others. Those that are not uh, symbiotic are saprotropes, which means that they are decomposers. And the zygomycota can reproduce sexually via what we call zoospores, and they can also produce asexually by sporangiospores. Now, um, they do lack cell walls, which is different than some of the other fungi that we've been talking about, and but they lack cell walls in every part except their reproductive structures. Those do have cell walls. And so what you're looking at in this picture is actually um, black bread mold. So it's in the zygomycota phyla. And so this is right here, black, <laughs> black bread mold. It's called Rhizopus stolonifer. And there are three kinds of specialized aseptate hyphae. Do you remember aseptate didn't have those divisions? Um, so the three are the stolen. That's the horizontal hyphae found on the surface of bread. Okay, what you're used to seeing is that white or greenish um, color. And then there are rhizoids. Those grow within the bread and anchors the mycelium into the bread and carries out the digestion. And then the third type of hyphae is what's called the sporangiophores. These are the aerial hyphae. Um, that's what we saw in the previous slide. And they carry out asexual reproduction via sporangia. Okay, those sporangia produce um, spores. So this is just to give you more of a diagrammatic representation. Sometimes that's easier to picture and then you can go, oh, okay, that's what that looks like. So to start at the bottom, we have the rhizoids that anchor the whole fungus into the bread. The stolon is this area that this that kind of runs along the surface. And then the sporangius, uh, bleh, sorry, sp sporangius for, oh my gosh, I can't talk today. Sporangia for, <laughs> um, which is the fruiting body. That's this whole portion, and at the top, it has sporangia, and that produces the spores. Okay, so here is our life cycle of the bread mold. Let's start with something we know. Um, let's start with our mating types. Here's our plus and minus strains. And just like all the other ones we've talked about before, we have cytoplasmic fusion, and as the gametangia form at the end of each hyphae, we have nuclear fusion, and then we have a diploid zygote. And that zygote um, is gonna produce these zygospores that will then undergo meiosis. And when they do, the sporangiophores develop and spores are released and they're spread everywhere and then they begin to germinate. And as they germinate then we see um, all the parts that we just talked about, the rhizoids, the stolon, um, and of course there's that uh, sporangio spor four that we talked about. And then so these hyphae right here in the rhizoids um, is where we're going to have the plus and minus mating types. Okay, and so that's where our cycle continues. Um, oh. Okay, moving on to our um, chytridiomycota, or what we call chytrids. <coughs> and these are the simplest of the fungi. Most of them are single cellular. Um, some do have branched hyphal forms with aseptate hyphae. They have flagellated gametes which is new, right? And they have spores, and they can either be saprotropes, which are decomposers, or they can be parasites. Now these live in an aquatic environment, 
That's important because when we have flagellated gametes, that usually tells you that it needs an aquatic environment. So they can reproduce asexually via the production of zoospores, and then some display what we call alternation of generation, which we'll talk more in detail about that when we get to plants. But just know for now that they can do asexual or sexual reproduction. So this is that their life cycle. Um, I'm not going to ask you to know this in detail, but just so you kind of understand where we're coming from. Uh, let's see where to start. <laughs> let's start with we have. Um, let's start with our sporophyte right here, and it's diploid. Okay, and so it goes through. Um, through sporangia to produce haploid zoospores. So we have meiosis taking place right here. Those haploid zoospores then germinate and we have what's called young gametophyte. Anytime you see the name gametophyte, it means it's going to produce gametes. So our mature gametophyte that is haploid um, has a male and female or plus and minus, but in this case male and female, um, strand to it. So we produce our male gamete, I'm uh, sorry, female gamete and our male gametes, and then we have fertilization. Then we have a zygote that then develops into a young sporophyte generation. That sporophyte can also go through this cycle to produce zoospores which then germinate into our young sporophyte. Okay, so this small section here, that would be asexual reproduction. And then this larger section here is how it would go through sexual reproduction. So we said we had a saprophytic chytrid. Um, here we go, <coughs> excuse me, um, producing zoospores, right? And what can happen is these sporangia can attach to um, algae that's inedible. And as it sinks, it then begins to um, break it down into smaller pieces. And the zooplankton are then able to eat um, what is broken down. Chytrids can also be parasitic, particularly to amphibians, and they cause a fungal infection on the skin of amphibians, but only within cells that are keratinized. Now, if you'll remember when we were talking about our amphibians, we mentioned that they needed cutaneous respiration, right? So that's a main way that they do gas exchange. Well. This particular type of chytrid inhibits that. Oh, and I should just say, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this scientific name. We're gonna call it the bat chytrid. Um, so the normal thickness um, of the keratinized layer of epidermis is between two and five microns. But with an infection, it can be really, really thick, like six, up to 60 microns. And so that means that that gas exchange does not occur efficiently. So it effectively suffocates um, the amphibians. And this particular chytrid is known to infest at least 93 different amphibian species that we know of and on all continents except for Asia, which is very interesting. Um, and it's thought to be the main reason that there's been a decline in the frog population globally since the 1960s. So I just wanted to show you this infected frog, poor thing. So the zoospores are um, discharged through a tube that emerges from the skin of the frog. So then more are produced, and of course it's this wet environment, so more and more get produced and spread really easily.
Last but not least is our microsporidia. These are the smallest known eukaryotic genomes. Um, they lack a mitochondria. They are what we call obligate intracellular animal parasites. So they have to be parasites. Um, their life cycle is haploid dominant. They do have a dikaryotic stage, but they don't spend most of their time in that dikaryotic stage. Okay, so microsporidia produce very unique spores. And their spores are dikaryotic, and you can tell that here in this image because we have the two nuclei within a single cell. But the important part is this polar tube right here. The polar tube is used to penetrate the host cell and to inject um, its material its DNA material into the host cell and produce more microsporidia. So that's unique to microsporidia and um, anytime you see that you can go, okay, I know which phyla that goes in. A prime example of a microsporidia is the myxobolus, um, which causes whirling disease in rainbow trout that are affected. So the myxobolus tends to infect juvenile fish and what it causes within these fish is a skeletal deformation, but more importantly, a neurological damage. So it's called whirling disease because the fish tend to whirl forward like in this strange corkscrew kind of pattern instead of swimming normally, which as you can imagine would affect um, its ability to run away from predators, its ability to catch prey, um, and so the mortality rate is very high for these young um, rainbow trout. Up to 90% um, of infected populations die um, in their fingerling stage. That's it for fungi. Next we're going to move on to plants. Woohoo!